Welcome to Ballarat Family Values Alliance. Tonight, we are pleased to have Diane Colbert speaking to us about the pedophile founders of the transgender movement and gender ideology. She has worked as a mental health worker with Psychiatric Rehabilitation Australia. Diane was training coordinator for Lifeline Telephone Counselors. She has qualifications in counselling and family therapy. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. As you've heard, my name is Diane, and I'm here tonight to talk about the pedophile founders of the transgender movement and gender ideology. Quite a serious topic that we're covering. Now, often we would hear people talking about pedophilia, and people often wondered why are they connecting the two together. And for me, it all came together when I started to read this book, which is written by a woman policeman in Britain who deals with catching pedophiles in the police unit she works with. And the first thing that it said in chapter one, what is a pedophile? The pedophile is sexually aroused by children. And I suddenly realized that term that is often with gender ideology spoken, children are sexual beings from birth. Who views children as sexual beings? A pedophile does. And so that's where the link came together for me, the understanding of why the transgender movement has been associated strongly with pedophiles. Not that transgender people are pedophiles, but that those who are pushing transgender movement, those who have been behind the founding of it, have been men and women with pedophile inclinations. So it all started with Dr. Alfred Kinsey. You may or may not have heard of him, but he is the founder of the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender and Reproduction. And according to his books, published research, and the statement of his assistants in various interviews, not only was his research flawed, but it was also criminal. Child sexuality research data was collected from personal logs of several pedophiles. One in particular kept detailed diaries of over 800 sexual encounters with children and that's Rex King and he actually was still abusing people 10 years after Alfred Kinsey knew that he was abusing people but he was taking his data from acts of abusing children and glorifying the abuse by calling it sexual research data. And even babies as young as two months old were being abused. Kinsey also collected data and financially compensated fathers who were sexually abusing their own children. One of them actually appears in this video, which you can go online and you can look at. It's called Secret Hin History, Kinsey's Pedophiles. And several of his co-workers and current workers for the Kinsey Research Institute are interviewed in this and one statement that really stuck out to me was when asked about why didn't you give the information of these pedophiles to the police the comment was that would have been immorality of the highest order to actually expose the pedophile to the police was seen as immorality of the highest order by the leaders of this Institute not the abuse that these children suffered being immorality of the highest order. So the thinking was completely twisted. There were many other things that you hear in this video. They talk about some of the co-workers being damaged by all their morality. So morality was seen to be damaging people, not a good thing. Purity was not seen as good. Promiscuity, that was seen as good. You know, he is Dr. Alfred Kinsey is actually held up to be the hero for bringing sexual freedom and overcoming the strict upbringing of his Methodist parents. He says in his book, Sexual Behaviour in the Human Female, it is difficult to understand why a child, except for its cultural conditioning, should be disturbed at having its genitalia touched or disturbed at seeing the genitalia of other persons or disturbed at even more specific sexual contacts. 
adult contacts are not likely to do the child any appreciable harm if the child's parents do not become disturbed. So again, we see support for pedophilia, for acts of pedophilia. And it's strongly throughout all of his work, all of his supposed research was based on data through sexual addictions and acts of pedophilia. John R. Dix comments, the medical model of human sexuality has been greatly influenced by the teachings of Dr. Alfred Kinsey, a zoologist. Over the last decade, aid, the scientific merit of the Kinsey reports has been found to be completely absent as exposed by the work of Dr. Judith Reisman. So even though we know that his research is flawed, we know that his data has been gathered through illegal acts, through abuse of children and others. Even with all of this, his research has still influenced and continues to influence our systems today. The sex education in schools was influenced by it. Alfred Kinsey actually advocated for shorter prison sentences for pedophiles in 1955. As a result of that, pedophiles were given shorter sentences and so they came out and abused again and again and it became a really bad cycle. His corrupt scheme is still the basis of education, especially early childhood development. He said sex with infants, children and animals is natural to the human animal from birth. And as I said earlier, it seems like promiscuity is now held up as a good thing and those who have the value of purity, that's seen as a bad thing, that's seen as wrong. I'm one of those people who was brought up in a home that valued purity, that valued good morals and ethics. And I'm actually really blessed that I was able to value purity in my growing up years because it saved me from a lot of heartache that I see many people go through as a result of not having that value. And I remember when I was doing my counselling studies, I actually was, as part of those studies in counselling and family therapy, had to study sexual addictions. And I remember as I looked at a lot of those content around sexual addictions, around pornography, that it really messed with my head. And I think about the sex education of young people and how a lot of that stuff would really mess with their heads. I was in my mid thirties when I started to study family therapy. And I honestly believe a lot of the stuff adolescents are learning is part of the reason why we do have stories of children abusing children and it's becoming far more common today. This book, Kinsey Crimes and Consequences by Judith Reisman is a really in-depth look at what happened with Alfred Kinsey, the research, the data, gives you a really good understanding of what I've been talking about. This is freely available through downloading a PDF copy off the internet so you can read it for yourself. Judith's journey began when her 10 year old daughter was sexually abused by a 13 year old in the 60s. And she writes that she couldn't believe this happened. Her daughter was very depressed as a result of it. She phoned a friend to talk to the friend about what had happened. And this trusted friend said, well, maybe she asked for it. After all, children are sexual beings from birth. Really troubled by the response that she received, she phoned another friend in a completely different geographic, completely different location. And she virtually hears the same response. Well, maybe she asked for it. After all, children are sexual beings from birth. It wasn't until later that she tied it in as she heard about Alfred Kinsey's teaching that children are sexual beings from birth, that she understood where this false teaching had come from. Now, I find it mind boggling that with Alfred Kinsey having been exposed for the person that he was, that with all of the information we have now, with his organization discredited through the work that they've done that's been illegal, that in 2004, the United Nations granted the Kinsey Institute 
ECO SOC accreditation. Now, this accreditation is given to places that have the highest standards. So they've been awarded by the United Nations an accreditation that is only given to people who uphold the highest standards. And when you look at the history of the Kinsey Institute, when you look at the fact that they're still teaching based on the foundations of Alfred Kinsey, then I think that's just horrendous. And I wonder, why is it that the Alfred Kinsey Institute has never been thoroughly investigated for withholding information around pedophiles? Why is it that they've never been held to account for such horrendous acts that have changed society in such an evil way. As a result of that, Dr. Reisman, Timothy Tate and Carolona Vidoki Christo, among others, launched a campaign from Croatia called Don't Touch the Children, with one of the first items asking the UN to re-examine the Kinsey accreditation. A letter was sent to each of head of the UN member states explaining the nature of the Kinsey research, including the pedophilic data and evidence. Not one member state acknowledged the letter. Now, just a little bit more about Alfred Kinsey. Part of how he got away with doing what he did was he was an upstanding, happily married man. At least that's how he presented to the public. The truth was he was a homosexual, that he regularly engaged in orgies, group sex, and that he and his wife had what was called an open marriage. You have sex with who you want to, honey, and I'll have sex with who I want to. And it talks about at one stage they both slept with one of his work colleagues. So this thinking has started now to permeate our society, that children are sexual beings. You can see it all over the internet. This lovely website here, holistic, mindful, sustainable, courageous, very nice looking website. And the first thing you see underneath it is this picture of these lovely two little children holding hands with sexual beings and an article written about how children are sexual beings. Another website, Youth Embassy, again, very attractive look looking. First thing you see is all human beings from birth until death are sexual beings. So you can see that the teachings of Alfred Kinsey have now permeated our society, they've permeated the education system, and they're the foundation for gender ideology. Now, Dr. Harry Benjamin is another one of the founding members of the transgender movement. In 1948, Kinsey, note the connection, Alfred Kinsey, recommended a patient to Benjamin. Born male, the patient expressed an acute desire to become a woman. At the time, the recommended treatment for individuals such as Benjamin's patient was psychoanalytic therapy aimed at making the mind fit the body. Benjamin, however, was unconvinced that, of the effectiveness of that approach. Seeing gender identity on a continuum, he believed that some people could be born male but feel female and that the more sensible treatment would be to alter the body to better fit the patient's perceived gender. He cancelled the patient to travel to Europe where surgeons performed one of the earliest gender reassignment operations. There's actually no follow-up to this so we don't actually know what happened with this one of the first individuals at a young age to receive surgery. We do know more about Dr John Money as things have come to light and as you can see there, he was around between 1921 and 2006. He was a psychologist, sexologist and author specialising into research into sexual identity and biology of gender. He was one of the first scientists to study the psychology of sexual fluidity and how the societal constructs of gender affect an individual. His work has been both celebrated for its innovation and criticised. Money has received around 65 worldwide honours, awards and degrees. Okay, so he's seen as a fairly highly regarded person by the amount of awards and degrees he has received. The John Jones story is a very famous story. Dr Money 
working at the John Hopkins Hospital, recommended a sex change of Bruce Reimer after a botched circumcision on April 27, 1966. He wanted to prove that nurture was more important than nature in determining gender. He wanted to, to prove that how society treated a person was more important to the person's valuing of who they were as a male or a female than their biological sex. So he had a bias that he wanted to prove. At 22 months old, Bruce becomes Brenda and his parents follow Dr. Money's order to socially condition Brenda as a girl. So Brenda wants to shave, they say, no, 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 you're a girl, you don't shave. They do everything they can to make Brenda into a happy little girl because after the botched circumcision, they knew there was no hope for her to be a happy little boy. They were really desperate. Yearly visits with Dr. Money took place where the children, Bruce Reimer and his twin brother, were assessed for the adaption of Brenda as a girl. And Dr. Money provided glowing reports in journals of the success. So year after year, Dr. Money is writing, yes, it's been a great success. Brenda has transitioned very well into being a girl. As a result of this research, people start changing their minds and they start following the trend because they've seen this test case upheld as proving the theory that nature is not as important as nurture, that nurture was more important. So it was widely publicized and gave credence to the arguments presented in the 1970s by feminists and others that humans are sexually neutral at birth and that sex roles are largely the product of social conditioning. But in fact, the gender conversion was far from successful. It was an experiment, a disaster for the Reimer family in every sense of the word. Poor little Brenda did not socialize well, was an outcast at school, had emotional difficulties and problems. Dr. Money knew about all of this, but he chose not to talk about the social problems and the difficulties and the emotional difficulties that his test case was experiencing. So really, he was a fraud because he presented fraudulent information to try and change people's viewpoint. He highlighted anything the parents said in a desperate attempt to make it work. They would say, oh yes, she looks so pretty in this little dress or something that they saw that could be interpreted as feminine. They were desperate to make it work because they wanted their child to be happy and they felt so guilty about the botched circumcision. So you can imagine what a horrible journey this is for the parents. So he didn't report any of the down things, but he reported anything that was seen as positive. During yearly visits, the children are shown nude photographs and forced into sexual positions. They are forced to perform incestuous acts for Dr. Money. So really, he is a pedophile because he is forcing the children to become naked in front of him, forcing them to do things to each other, and also showing them nude photographs. Do you identify, would you like to have sex with this person or with this person? Things that you should not be asking young children as part of his social experimentation. David's brother didn't cope well with the knowledge that his sister was really born a boy. So there comes a point when the parents have to tell Brenda the truth and it's reported that the trauma of this led to his twin brother developing schizophrenia and in 2002 he died of an overdose on antidepressants. There is documentation around when Dr. Money went to the home to try and visit the boys. They were so traumatized by him that they hid in the basement. They just did not want to socialize. And the parents forced them to come up and have dinner with Dr. Money. And as soon as dinner was over, they went back to the basement. They refused to see him because they just could not cope with him. May 4, 2004, David Reimer also ends his life. And 
A person who worked with him wrote a book around his life, writes, it was what David was inclined to brood about that killed him. David's blighted childhood was never far from his mind. Just before he died, he talked to his wife about his sexual inadequacy, his inability to be a true husband. It talks about in some of the reports how David was just haunted by his childhood. And when he talks about it, he speaks about himself in a second person as though it's not himself because he can't actually look at it as himself. At the John Hopkins University, which in the 1960s was the first medical American center to venture into sex reassignment surgery, they launched a study in the 70s comparing the outcomes of transgendered people who had the surgery with the outcomes of those who did not. Most of the surgically treated patients described themselves as satisfied by the results. They felt that they were satisfied. They felt it made their life better. However, their subsequent psychosocial adjustments were no better than those who didn't have the surgery. They weren't functioning better emotionally, psychologically. It didn't improve their family relationships, their social relationships. And so, when they found that it didn't improve their life, they stopped doing sex reassignment surgery since producing a satisfied but still troubled patient seemed an inadequate reason for surgically amputating normal organs. And that's written by Dr. Paul McHugh, who was psychiatrist in chief of the John Hopkins Hospital. He actually wanted more than Dr. Money's word for it that the transgender surgeries were necessary and were helping, and so that's why the research was ordered. Walt Heyer, now before I read this, I'll just tell you a little bit about Walt. Walt grew up in a home where grandma, at the age of four, was dressing him up in little purple pretty dress. And as a result, he grew up with gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder as it was known then. Now he was very unhappy and at around 42, he has gender reassignment surgery and becomes a girl. After eight years, he transitions back to being a male and he says, I wanted to be so desperately a male, as desperately as I had ever wanted to be a woman. And so he is someone who actually really understands the lie that gender dysphoria requires surgery because of his personal experience of trauma at a young age, being cross-dressed by a trusted family member leading to gender dysphoria. He writes, the setting for the first transgender surgeries, mostly male to female, was in university-based clinics starting in the 1950s and progressing through the 1960s and the 70s. When the researchers tallied the results and found no objective proof that it was successful, and in fact, evidence that it was harmful, the university stopped offering sex reassignment surgery. Since then, Private surgeons have stepped in to take their place without any scrutiny or accountability for their results. Their practices have grown, leaving shame, regret and suicide in their wake. So it was not just the Hopkins Clinic reporting lack of outcomes from surgery. Around the same time, serious questions about the effectiveness of gender change came from Dr. Harry Benjamin's partner, endocrinologist Charles Illenfeld. So remember Dr. Harry Benjamin had his first case referred to him by Alfred Kinsey. Okay, so he would have been influenced in his ideas on gender ideology by Alfred Kinsey. Illenfeld worked with Benjamin for six years and administered sex hormones to 500 transsexuals. Illenfeld shocked Benjamin by publicly announcing that 80% of the people who want to change their gender shouldn't do it. Illenfeld said, there is too much unhappiness among people who have had the surgery. Too many end in suicide. Illenfeld stopped administering hormones to patients experiencing gender dysphoria and switched specialties from endocrinology to psychiatry so he could offer such patients the kind of help he thought they really needed. So there's lots of questions coming from lots of different people about what really is happening and that 
there is a lack of positive outcomes with transgender surgeries. Treating a psychological problem with a physical solution, it just wasn't working. In the wake of the Hopkins study and the closure of the flagship Hopkins Clinic, and the warning sounded by Ilan Feld, advocates of sex change surgery needed a new strategy. Benjamin, okay, so Dr. Benjamin, the man who was influenced by Kinsey, and money, a fraud, someone who lied in journals and tried to make it look like it was working when it wasn't, okay. They looked to their friend Paul Walker, a homosexual and transgender activist they knew shared their passion to provide hormones and surgery. A committee was formed to draft standards of care for transgenders that furthered their agenda with Paul Walker at the helm. The committee included a psychiatrist, a paedophilia activist, two plastic surgeons and a urologist, all of whom would financially benefit from keeping gender reassignment surgery available for anyone who wanted it. The Harry Benjamin International Standards of Care were published in 1979 and gave fresh life to gender surgery. So we have a set of standards that have come from a preconceived bias. There has been a preconceived bias by Benjamin Walker and Money and others who benefited financially from keeping gender reassignment surgery alive. And that's where these standards have begun. The standards of care for the health of transsexual, transgender and gender non-conforming people by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, formerly known as the Benjamin Standards of Care, are the most widespread standards of care used by professionals working with transsexual, transgender or gender variant people. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health standards of care are periodically updated and revised. The last revision was released September 25, 2011. This is the seventh version of the standards since the original 1979 documentation was drafted. So here we have standards of care based on a foundation of documentation that was written by people who had a preconceived bias to say gender surgery is the answer to a psychological problem. Walt Heyer, Foltz Walker, he was his doctor, Dr. Paul Walker, for not telling him about the Hopkins study and its deadly conclusions and subjecting him to surgery that he must have known would do nothing to cure his gender confusion. Since then, Walt has experienced the shame and remorse of transgender clients who undergo these procedures. Walt says, those who regret their decision have few places to turn in a world of pro-transgender activism. For me, it took years to muster the courage to stand up and speak out about the regret. Dr. Paul McHugh goes on to say, policymakers and the media are doing no favors either to the public or the transgendered by treating their confusions as a right in need of defending rather than as a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. This intensely felt sense of being transgendered constitutes a mental disorder in two respects. The first is that the idea of sex misalignment is simply mistaken. It does not correspond with physical reality. The second is that it can lead to grim psychological outcomes. And we all hear about those grim psychological outcomes, the higher rates of mental illness and suicide among those that are transgendered. Now, sometimes people hold up the intersex and say, well, some people are born intersex, you know, that's just like being transgender. I would say, no, that isn't. Dr. Paul McHugh says, although much is made of it, no evidence supports the claim that people such as Bruce Jenner have a biological source for their transgender assumptions. Plenty of evidence demonstrates that with him and most others, transgendering is a psychological rather than a biological matter. And I think, you know, some people are born with a healthy heart. Some people are born with a heart problem. That's a defect. Some people are born with healthy genitals. Some people have defects. That is a defect. It doesn't make sense taking someone born with a defect and then saying, well, 
people who are born normally healthy you know they have a defect too because some people have a defect that's like saying that people with a perfect heart that have panic attacks should have surgery for their panic attacks that wouldn't make sense Walt Hauer writes the transgendered life is often a direct result of early childhood difficulty or trauma assisting a young child into the fabricated ideology of a transgender life is not helping the child sort out what is real and what is fiction Rupert Everett, an actor, told the Sunday Times magazine, I really wanted to be a girl. Thank God the world of now wasn't then, because I'd be on hormones and I'd be a woman. After I was 15, I never wanted to be a woman again. And you hear that story over and over again from many people. Walt Hauer writes, while studying psychology in a university program, I discovered that trans kids most often are suffering from a variety of disorders, starting with depression, the result of personal loss, broken families, sexual abuse and unstable homes. So here we have a basis again of psychological and emotional problems creating gender dysphoria. Now I want to talk a little bit about the father wound. This is something that we actually have a lot of studies around because we know that fatherlessness and father wounds create a lot of emotional and psychological problems. And it's named that because it's almost always inflicted on us at the hands of our fathers or by a significant male role model. When their words or actions inflict a major psychological injury, or when his consistent and lasting chain of verbal abuses is internalized by a child, their psychological and very spirit-felt father wound affects both young boys and girls throughout their lifetime. It can manifest itself in many different ways to include homosexuality. Other effects are bisexuality, sexual promiscuity, transgenderism, or gender confusion issues, rebellion, resentment, street gang or criminal activity, alcohol and or drug abuse, and also chronic depression and suicides, just to name a few. And that's written by Dean Bailey in his article, The Fifty Shades of Grey. The American College of Pediatricians urges educators and legislatures to reject all policies that condition children to accept as normal a life of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex. Facts, not ideology, determine reality. Now I want to talk about a new trend, although it's not as new as I thought. There's actually some data there from the last five to ten years, if you look it up. And that's minor attracted persons. And that may or may not be a term you've heard before. It's the new term for pedophile, minor attracted persons. So one person writes an article about what was learned from looking at articles written by the Director of Operations, Richard Cranmer, at Before You Act, which is a website that is basically advocating for minor attracted persons to have mental health services. And so some of the things that they say is, Pedophilia is an orientation, is not a choice. Does that sound familiar? Pedophilia is an orientation, it's not a choice. Efforts to treat pedophilia are similar to methods used on homosexuals 50 years ago and similarly ineffective. So they're now comparing how homosexuals were treated 50 years ago and saying, that that was ineffective and it's ineffective to try those treatments on pedophiles to try to stop them from abusing. Minor attracted persons do not exhibit narcissism, psychosexual immaturity, psychopathology, neurosis or any personality disorder more than people attracted to adults. In other words, they're just like you and me. That's what they're trying to make them to be. Just like you, just like me. One more thing according to Cranmer, many pedophile, sorry, minor attracted persons interact with minors in a variety of non-sexual ways and develop close friendships with them. 
Gee, that's really comforting for all you mums and dads out there, isn't there? That many minor attracted persons might be interacting with your minors in a variety of non-sexual ways and developing close friendships with them. Very disturbing thought. Now, I read an article in a newspaper from New Zealand. A teacher who'd been having sex with a 10-year-old was jailed and this reporter is talking about some follow-up and this is the statement the reporter makes. The case clearly involves a process of change that has been commented on elsewhere. That 95% of sexual contacts between adults and children under age 12 are situations where trauma does not happen at the time the sexual contact occurs. Trauma is experienced when the young person comes to appreciate society's views and punishment directed at a person involved in such exchanges. This third point suggests we as a society can reduce that trauma by changing the way we act. So they're saying the child is not traumatized by being sexually abused. No, 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 that's not the reason for the trauma. The trauma is the way that we as society view pedophilia. That's what's the trauma for the child. They come to realize, oh, that was wrong and yes, I've been abused. So that shows you where the pedophilia activists are leading, where they're heading in trying to normalize pedophilia as if it's just something that people are born with, something they can't help. We should be really sympathetic to them because they're victims and they have no choice. They were born that way. And I think it's really important that we're aware that this is where there is a current push. So that is the end of my presentation this evening. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a long evening. Thanks for your attention. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.